is Kristen with Explicitly Pro-Life. Thanks for tuning in this week. Uh, This week I have a very special guest, former Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker. We are here in Milwaukee, uh, and we're going to have a conversation today about some partnership opportunities, some things that we've been working on together. Uh, If you read my emails, and yes, I write them, and yes, I do reply to them, (laughs) uh, Students for Life recently launched a sister organization, Students for Life Action, which is a 501c4 organization, which means we can do more regarding elections and state legislative fights and federal legislation fights, something that we've been constantly been pulled into with having 1,200 groups across, uh, you know, 50 states of how more we can get the pro-life gen interested and involved in the political process. Uh, We know that, you know, the the political is not the be-all, end-all for victory of our movement because our, our movement relies on making abortion illegal and unthinkable. But politics is a very important place that we have to mm-hmm. fight. So uh, today I asked Governor Walker, we were here for a board meeting yeah. for Students for Life Action, but I asked the governor to come on to the podcast so we can share a little bit about our plans, sure. what we've got coming up, what we discussed, what we hashed out today. Um, one of the things I know we started, we talked a lot about this morning was a post-Row America. Right. Um, this is something that you know the mainstream press is really interested in. When we started Students for Life 13 years ago, actually 13 years ago this week, uh, I used to introduce myself as, you know, hey, I'm Kristen. I started this group called Students for Life America. We're a post-row organization. And a lot of my friends actually <laughs> at the time told me I need to stop saying that because I was freaking everybody out uh, by saying that we were post-row 13 years ago. Like no one... That was considered too naive, too crazy, too yeah. extreme. Uh, but now I'm so excited because now I can say it as much as I want because this is something that's going to become reality right. very soon. Uh, many of us believe, and it's something that the left certainly believes. Planned Parenthood. That's why they're fighting so hard? That's what. Yeah, I mean, their new president. Shuts their business down. Yeah, their new president just came out. Her first interview at CBS, you know, said, you know, I, you know, believe Roe versus Wade's in serious jeopardy. I'm like, yeah, we finally agree on something. Uh, Planned Parenthood. So you and I are going to be talking on college campuses, mm-hmm. and we're going to – we just had an op-ed published, a real clear politics about what a post-Roe America looks like because I think you know one of the things we have to do as a pro-life movement is we have to demystify that unknown, right? The left uh, – and any time in politics, you know, the, your opponent's going to use the unknown mm-hmm. as that scare tactic. Right. Um, and so in order to make it not scary, we just have to simply say – This is what it's going to be like, and this is what we envision. Um, So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, you know, as a former governor, as someone who's kind of kind of walked the walk, Mm talked the talk here in Wisconsin. What are some of the policies that you're thinking that we need to, as a pro life movement, need to be thinking about right now for a post for America, whether it's in states, whether it's in communities, Mm -hmm. or whether it's in Washington D.C. on Capitol Hill. Well, across the board, you got to do more to support uh, women, more to support families, uh, whether it's early on with uh, thinking about uh, supporting healthy uh, pregnancies. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of the, the, the myth about Planned Parenthood is that somehow they're involved with uh, healthy women's programs. It couldn't be further from the truth. They're about making money and about abortion. And so doing more to make sure you're not just defunding Planned Parenthood, but putting those dollars into legitimate, right. non-controversial programs that help women and help families, um, not only through childbirth, but but thereafter. I mean, one of the mm-hmm. things we did in Wisconsin, particularly proud about, we, we worked on our Medicaid system first time ever. Uh, people are sh- shocked when I say first time ever. It didn't matter if it was a Democrat or Republican governor. First time ever while I was governor, we covered everyone living in poverty under Medicaid. Uh, and you were a Republican. I'm a Republican. You and were a Republican, the shout out. And, and I didn't take the Medicaid expansion or Obamacare because I didn't like the problems with Obamacare either. Mm-hmm. So, uh, in fact, just recently, uh, the, the current governor, a Democrat, acknowledged that insurance premiums just on the regular market uh, for uh, individuals in Wisconsin were going down by about 3.2%. So actually going down. So That's like l- unheard of. Right, lower anyone premiums. anyone has insurance policies, they always go up. Exactly. Your it's goal just, is to be like under 18%. Exactly. The key is to have the percentage of... Of increase go down. This actually went down because of a program we've done over the last few years. So covered everyone, 
didn't take the, the Medicaid expansion because I had real problems with Obamacare. Sure. Uh, still saw insurance premiums going down on health care plans in the state. But it's more than just that. It's making sure that, that kids have uh, good prenatal care. It's making sure when they're born they have good health care. It's making sure they have access to great education. So right. we made tremendous gains in public education, but also in choice and in charter schools, understanding that you actually, I actually trust parents and so do a lot of others to make the right choice for their mm-hmm. sons or daughters. Uh, doing things like changing the tax code to put a bit better benefit on getting rid of the marriage penalty and Mm -hmm. providing more per child so that uh, people who have children actually have uh, some assistance because you and I both know having kids, yours are younger, mine are older now, uh, but there's a lot of cost incurred with having kids. And even just things like we we dramatically changed the foster care system. We Mm -hmm. changed uh, adoptions. We made it easier to adopt, and we made it more supportive for people who were caring for kids in foster care all those things tie together. And I think over decades, Planned Parenthood and others in, in, who are radicalized on the abortion movement have tried to make it seem like any of us who are pro-life only cared about making uh, abortion illegal. But what you said is exactly what we care about is, is making abortion just unthinkable, unacceptable. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but we understand that the circumstances that sometimes put people in those situations aren't going to go away. Yeah. We just want to give them better options yeah, so that right. they don't think about abortion, but that they know that that doesn't mean that there aren't people willing to help them out, get them on their feet, and help them and their families going forward. Oh, that's great. I loved everything you said. If every governor of America just did what you said, <laughs> we'd be great. We would have a post for America. Well, we can do it at every level. You know, right. the president and Congress, you can do it. Governor, you can even do it at, sure. at the state and local level. There's just so many ways. That, and those should be things that aren't partisan. I mean, mm-hmm. making sure that families are strong, keeping families intact, making sure kids are healthy. I mean, those are all things that can be done in a way uh, that's very positive um, and, and actually very cost effective. Mm-hmm. If you help kids early on um, and they have start out healthy, chances are through the rest of their life, they're going to be healthy. Uh, but there's just simple things. That even, what we call the success sequence. We took it from, of all places, the Brookings Institute had a report mm. on this, so not exactly a hardcore conservative <laughs> think tank, but they affirmed what, what we tried to do throughout our eight years as governor, and that is if you push a success sequence that says, you know, hey, if you get an education, you get a job, you get married and have a kid, uh, the chances are that you're going to live, I think it's like 98% of the people who do those four simple things are living middle class or higher lives. Mm. Not, not that money That's alone is the sole answer, but sure. we can do things to help people, support people to make those things going forward possible. And then that helps everything in society. That's right. If you value life, everything else works. That's right. I mean, it's, we started our Pregnant on Campus program uh, in 2011, and, and the idea was very simple. You know, a, a child who is born into poverty is seven times more yeah. likely to live in poverty his or her, her own life. So exactly. if you want to impact his life or her life, you have to start by making sure his or her mother yeah. gets the degree that she needs and that she can go out and be a contributing member of the workforce. And that it, it's not going to be easy, certainly, especially if she's single, a single right. mother, if the partner is not involved, the father is not involved. Um, but you're going to give her and her child the best chance of success by making sure she can actually graduate college and, and not feel like po- she has to drop out because she's pregnant. Right. And there's good policies that interchange in there. So for example, example, we made it easier to have uh, virtual schools uh, mm-hmm. in Wisconsin. We expanded opportunities there. That's well, huge. If, if, now, it's good for a lot of reasons, not just this, but if a young girl is pregnant in, in high school age girl, she might choose to go to a virtual school where it's, it's easier to care for her child. It's easier mm-hmm. to go through even before that through her pregnancy uh, where she doesn't physically have to be as, uh, on the campus of yeah. the school the whole time. Sorry. There are ways to do that. Later in the college or even an associate degree, we created the University of Wisconsin Flex Option, which, again, it's not just for this reason. It's, it's for all sorts of non-traditional students out there. But it gives the option of saying instead of having to be on campus, not just through uh, online virtual education, mm-hmm. but even through alternatives to the classroom, those are ways that, you know, for a lot of parents, mm-hmm. uh, getting up and taking off a semester, living away from home, being away from work is not viable but we we provided ways to make it easier for people in those sorts of circumstances. That's huge. Um, and that's so that's so refreshing because this is exactly what we need. We need kind of out of out of the box ideas and thinking about how do we solve these very real problems yeah. that there should be solutions to. You mentioned um, not wanting to take, you know, the, the federal match for Obamacare, the kind of the holding states hostage plan yeah. that President Obama had. Um, I think I have an answer to this, but I'd like to hear your answer. 
why is Obamacare a bad idea for Americans or America? Yeah. Well, to me, the idea, and it's even worse when you do Medicare for all, which may sound on the surface like it's good, but but the idea of giving government oh. control over anything. That's what I'm leading up to is this Medicare for all crap that yeah, we're hearing right now. But particularly now. Yeah. giving, it, well, not only the fact that if you're an average citizen who gets their health insurance from an employer, you're going to see a massive tax increase and you're not going to see the And you're going to lose your insurance. Right. Like you're Kamala gonna, actually said, you're going to lose your insurance. You're not going to get private uh, insurance right now. And if people say, oh, you know, I got a problem with my insurance, well, try it with the federal government. I mean, look at, think of all, sadly, all over the years, over the last decade, all the military families who've talked about the problems they have with the VA, thankfully they made some improvements out there, but it's still some significant challenges depending on where you're at across the country. Uh, but the idea, I mean, you compare um, – what you get from uh, FedEx or UPS versus the postal system. You look at all the other chain. Look at how many people across America, you know, think of, would you like to go to DMV and get your health care taken care of? Mm-hmm. I think most people, no matter how many improvements have been made in the Department of Motor Vehicles, would not want to stand in line no. and go through that process to get, not just for you, but for your kids, for your family. And that's really the problem. We need you know, a system that doesn't treat people like a statistic, but rather has patient-centered, focused out that mm-hmm. it treats people like an individual. You don't get that under Obamacare. You certainly wouldn't get that under Medicare for All. No, I mean, that's what we're hearing. You know, we're going to hear it over and over again this election cycle. Democrats are all about Medicare for All. That's, you know, their new socialized medicine mm-hmm. push. And as someone who has two children with high, complex, expensive medical illness, cystic fibrosis, that scares me more than anything else that they say um, because it's kids like mine who get left out of the system, right? Who have a rare, you know, un- uncurable genetic disease that only you know, a handful of people have right. throughout the world. Right. Um, and, who, you know, Gunner and Gracie's, one of their prescriptions, for example, is expensive. You might as well, buy, you could buy a new car every single mm. month for what yeah. it costs. Yeah. And, and these are drugs that, Thankfully, we have access to them because we live here in America right. where right. we actually are paying for the R&D. In the UK, for example, uh, the drug that Gunnar and Gracie are on, the, the government, the British government is actually refusing to give it to cystic fibrosis patients. They had 80,000 doses <sighs> dosages that actually expired this spring on the shelf because they refused to negotiate with Vertex Pharmaceuticals based in Boston on the price. They don't care. To them, wow. it's it's worth... I mean, this was like the first drug in the history of the yeah. world, actually, that corrects a genetic defect that actually we know, and, and most uh, cystic fibrosis, you know, scientists and experts believe mm-hmm. can actually extend the life of our children up to a decade long and patients in the UK still don't have access to it because they have socialized health care. Right. And then I'm supposed to believe that this is a good thing. I mean, this is, I've heard it, the why I'm asking you this is because I've heard it, especially with pro, I've heard it with pro-life young people. Mm. I've heard this argument of, well, I'm pro-life for, you know, the child in the womb to the, the two-year-old living in poverty to the mom in crisis. Yeah. Uh, therefore, I should be for, you know, Medicare for all because that helps everybody. And that's a pro-life policy. But in fact, it's, it's not. Um, you know, the socialized health care is, is not a pro-life policy. And in fact, what it's going to do is people who are vulnerable are the ones mm-hmm. are going to be left out. Yeah. And the rest of us are going to be basically dealing with really crappy health care coverage. Like we see <laughs> elsewhere in the world. That's exactly uh-huh. right. Waiting in line for well, what and we people need. with means end up coming to the United that's States. Right. We see it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people who have money, they're still going to go where they need to go. And the rest of us are going to be dealt with what's the rest. Um, and so I think that's I think that's a really important thing that the pro-life movement actually mm-hmm. needs to be talking more and more about is this Medicare for all. And what what does that actually mean? You know, we we fought Obamacare back in 2009, 2010. And we said, look, this is going to be the largest expansion of abortion right. ever. And we were right. Like yeah. uh, Planned Parenthood's funding almost doubled overnight yeah. Yeah. through Obamacare. Well, think about Medicare for all. Then that's all government money. And if you got people, like you said, the, the last remaining one of the bunch – out of all the people up on those debate stages who even had an ounce of dignity, Joe Biden throwing his towel in and saying he too was going to be against the Hyde Amendment. Well, if if everybody's getting their health care through the government, the government, like it was the, the first two years of Barack Obama's presidency, if it's controlled by a party that believes that abortion should be funded uh, through the taxpayers, you're going to have uh, nothing compared to what we had in Obamacare. It's going to be even worse. Yeah, absolutely. And they've already, actually already said that, that mm-hmm. you know, they're all for taxpayer-funded abortion. Yep. Hands down. For any reason, all nine months of pregnancy, 
uh, th- that's what we're going to be funding. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have a question. You have just been, you are now the uh, president elect yeah. <laughs> of YAF, Young Americans Foundation. I have the honor of kind of being a YAF yeah. speaker. Yeah, quite a bit. Um, I spoke at a YAF conference recently. So did you as the new interim president. I believe you're taking hold of the presidency February 2021. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so... Longest president-elect ever, but I tried a couple of years ago to be president-elect, so I'm, I'm going to squeeze as much out of it as right. I can. That's right. You can get, yeah, get it all in now, right? I don't know if the inaugural ball will be quite right, as grand exactly, for this one. Right, exactly. But yeah, so you're going to be working with young conservative kids on yeah. college and high school campuses. I'm excited because I hope that we can partner with yeah, Students for, for Life because sure. I think this is important that, you know, pro-life students understand why voting matters, why voting pro-life matters, and that means voting conservative in most cases. Uh, but I also think it's important because I hear this a lot from conservative kids of, well, you know, I'm, I'm fiscally conservative, but I think we should leave the social issues alone. What do you say to young people who say that? Well, it's real simple. It actually fits in with an argument I often make on, just in general on campuses about the difference between socialism and freedom. Some people say capitalism. I just say freedom, free enterprise, freedom in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that is I, I contrast the taxi with an Uber. Mm-hmm. I said taxis are like socialism, the far left these days. Uh, taxis are in cities that are highly regulated, highly restricted. They only let certain people in. They box everybody else out. There's usually a big mm-hmm. fee, a big tax involved with it because kind of like that philosophy, they believe the government should make those decisions. They believe in the government. I said, those of us right of center who believe in free enterprise and freedom, we're kind of like Uber. You know, Uber says as long as the driver and the passenger are safe, they don't care whether you drive once a day or all day long. They don't care if it's a hobby or a profession. All they care about is that safety. And that's really kind of my point of view is, you know, live your own dream, run your own life, pursue your own career, do whatever you want. As long as you don't hurt the health and safety of your neighbors, which is, a, you know, in a, a just society where you mm-hmm, uphold the laws. Yeah. It's why top of the list, obviously for me, <laughs> uh, is protecting the sanctity of the unborn of innocent life all the way through a natural death. Those are things that fit into that. But beyond that, you know, we're saying, hey, you want to do other stuff? I'm not going to mess with your other decisions. I'm not going to tell you what to do. We're going to care for those in the greatest need. We're going to protect the health and safety of our neighbors. And it's interesting, and people hear that, they kind of go, okay, that makes sense. But the argument about social issues, I said, well, it's inherent. How can you, how can anything else? It's like a foundation building block. If you don't believe in the sanctity of life in this country, of, of any country in the world, it's a country based on the principle of freedom. Yeah, that's you know, right. That our declaration talked about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If you can't have access to life, then what else matters out there? And the line has been drawn. You know, some mm-hmm. people, when I was a kid, they say, oh, well, you know, it's only in the first two trimesters. And then it was, you know, partial birth abortion. And and now it's literally talking about people who, and I say it's not infanticide, it's not live birth abortion. What Ralph Northam was talking about in Virginia earlier this year is flat out murder. Because mm-hmm. if you waited as a couple did recently on California, it's a horrific story where they strangled their newborn child a few hours after they came home from the hospital. Uh, I, I got pushed back. I almost got shut off of Twitter for retweeting that news story and saying, that's horrific, but how much different is that story from the one Ralph Northam talked about other than a few hours? I think when people hear that, and we, we talk about that again from our heart, not just mm-hmm. from our head, right. it can make a huge difference for any age, but particularly on our campuses. Yeah, I can't believe that Twitter almost put you in Twitter jail yeah. for that. Apparently, so now I tweet anything, a picture, a link, anything. It always says, like, you know, you have to Sensitive. click here. Sense. I'm like, what did I tweet out? I'm blaming live action. I probably retweeted <laughs> Lila or something. Um, well, so- we had a Yaf. Actually, you mentioned Yaf. Yaf had a video that they tweeted of um, a group on the University of Wisconsin-Madison, very liberal campus, uh, but a group of uh, pro-life students who had abortion posters posters out there. Oh, yeah, the Equal Display, I think. Right, and the woman came out from her minivan and came up and started spraying, spray painting there, and they videotaped. They were actually, the videotape showed they were very, Mm -hmm. as they usually are, very very polite, said, hey, ma'am, you just can't do this. This is private property. You can't do this. You can't do it. They were smart enough to follow her back to her minivan, got her license plate, and then later on the clip, on the reel, they put together, they showed that the police, the the, the University of Wisconsin uh, Police Department actually picked her up and, t- mm-hmm. and you know did an interview and the whole bit. And she talked about being triggered. Well, yeah, it, it is. I can understand yeah. what triggered. It's probably why we shouldn't be doing it. Yeah, no, I I, uh, I did this video with Gunnar, my oldest, and I explained abortion to him a couple months ago. 
I put it up on Instagram. There was no bloody images, mm-hmm. but I had fetal models, some of the tools, and you know we you know, we kind of videotaped it because I I wanted Gunnar was very expressionate, yeah. And so he I wanted to capture like a, a person's actual mm-hmm. expression, their gut instinct when they hear about abortion, and uh, the comments I got you know from the yeah. the, the pro abortion left were this person's brainwashing a child. How dare you tell your child that what you're triggering and I'm like. If you have such a problem with what I just right. described, then how can you support abortion? Like, if you're going to be mm-hmm. pro-abortion, if you're going to be pro-choice, be yeah. then be all in. Be okay with what I described. If you have something wrong with what I described, then you have something. You think there's something wrong with abortion. But remember, these are the same people who came after me and other governors and leaders across the country when we passed laws that require them to sh- to provide an ultrasound yeah. uh, before how an abortion you? is performed. And like, well, how can, you know, how, how, how awful that is that she would have to see that. You're like, to know what you're going to do? I yeah. mean, to, to know? I mean, that it, in this day and age, I can't fathom that. It, Matt and Alex, uh, Matt was born in June, Alex was born in July. Tonette and I have both, even though it's 25 years later, we have both of their first baby pictures, which are <laughs> ultrasound images that were very grainy back then. Yeah, the old Today, school. I have friends who show me their kids or their grandkids on their iPhones and they're three D. Oh yeah. It's unbelievable. I have mine. Yeah. I can see my whole my children's all their facial features. Yeah. Who they're gonna look like. Well Matthew, even those grady ones had his his hand out, it was a side angle mm-hmm. and you could see him sucking his thumb. And you obviously I was pro life already then, but there was no denying it when you saw it there. That's right. Which is why I get why Planned Parent and others don't want people to see that. Yeah. Because if you see it how can you justify taking that life? Yeah, I mean that's that that's the left's entire you know mantra, right? It was mm-hmm. dehumanize that preborn child, You'd call that child a fetus, a parasite, right. a blob of tissue. Call it whatever you want, mm-hmm. but don't call it a baby. Don't call it a child. Because well, and the you amazing, can't. right? And the amazing part about it, I always think to myself when you see now that you can really see it with those mm-hmm. ultrasound, when you see the beating heart, yeah. And you think again, just the logic of it, not only the the emotion of seeing that the baby and the hands and the but the beating heart, I mean the definition of death is is in part when a heart ceases to beat. Mm-hmm. you know if my heart stops, I have a heart attack, I'm dead. Mm-hmm. So the opposite of that is when my heart starts, I'm alive, right? by logic. Yeah. Yeah, they they don't they don't subscribe to logic on no. college campuses. Sadly, a lot of no. times we'll see that when we're on tour together uh, this uh, this fall. I'm sure. Yeah. So we talked a little bit today about students for life action. Mm-hmm. What we're doing just to give everybody at home kind of an update. So we're going to be engaged in Virginia. You've been already engaged yeah. in Virginia uh, because this is a fight, you know, for the state legislature. Uh, Virginia has gone blue, very liberal in the governor and lieutenant governor races. The state legislature has been keeping, you know, those New York style law, right. Illinois style laws at bay. You know, Kathy Tram, who introduced yep. that abortion up to the moment of birth bill, she got shot down really yeah. quick this year because there were pro-life Republicans. Well, uh, the state was redistricted. I think it was like a University of California Berkeley professor got to like draw the redistricting yeah. line. It just shows you how crazy. Eric Holder, and this is a good example. <laughs> Eric Holder, the former attorney general under Barack Obama. Holder and Obama have raised something like $250 million. They've got Terry McAuliffe, who was the governor of Virginia, yeah. involved with it now, too. They're raising about $400 million. So in states like Virginia and elsewhere to come in and litigate, or as we call sue until it's blue, but come in and redraw those boundaries, which puts pro-life majorities at yeah. a serious risk across the nation. And, and that's we what can we're do seeing, something about in Virginia. And that's what we're seeing the majority yep. of pro-life laws being passed. You know, we had 300 pro-life laws were introduced just this year alone. There's been more than three to 400 pro-life laws passed in the last decade. And so all of the progress we're seeing mm-hmm. has been on the state legislative side. Yep. My very first episode of Explicitly Pro-Life was why state politics matters. We tend to focus all on Washington, right. D.C. Right. And while the Supreme Court is hugely important for right. our post row America, um, nothing really happens in Washington, D.C., if you haven't noticed. Yeah, even more um, so these days. All yeah, all the action is happening in the states. And last year there was a report that came out was from the Reproductive Healthcare Investors Alliance. <laughs> That's it was, just, it was this big report that all the big mega uh you know pro planned parenthood pro abortion donors had put together and it was a study of where it was you Mm. know a a swat strengths Mm -hmm. weaknesses opportunities threats and where one of their biggest weaknesses they identified one of their biggest opportunities was state legislative action they identified that we're winning in states and i can't keep up that's why you saw you know the new york law passed then the the repeal act in illinois and why kathy tram tried her silly business so we're going to be in virginia you and i are going to be touring some schools in virginia uh trying to get young pro-life students 
students mm-hmm. to go out, door knock. We're going to be making phone calls into key districts to make sure we can try to keep that legislature uh, red, keep it pro-life. We're going to be partnering with a group that I have for close friends with, uh, Susan B. Anthony List, yeah. and try to make sure no one's reduplicating the wheel and busing in students. So we want people to come to Virginia to help us. Um, that's going to be key. It's going to be a, a good battleground for us since we've launched this new organization, yeah. getting ready for 2020, right. um, because we're going to be fighting, you know, there's going to be several swing states, Senate swing states, and presidential swing states coming up in 2020 that we're going to have to be prepared for. Um, But we're also going to be in state legislatures, too. Mm -hmm. Uh, This year, Students for Life Action, we were were monitoring more than 20 pieces of legislation. We testified in dozens of states, had young pro-life kids testifying against bills, in favor of bills, giving a different perspective. I think it's really great, like in Washington State, we always show up. We have our blue I'm the Pro-Life Gen shirts. Planned Parenthood shows up pink shirts, and all the young people are in blue, nice. right? The legislators all the times, they think that we are the pro-abortion forces um, because all the old white people <laughs> are the Planned Parenthood people. <laughs> And we're like, no, this is who we are. Right. Uh, we're the pro-life generation. So we're gonna be we're gonna be involved. We've got the RU forty six bound California. It's still waging right now, the SB twenty four, which we believe will be passed and signed into law before end of October, which uh, will yeah. uh, allow the state of California to dispense the abortion drug on every single college mm. campus, which they want to kind of transfer over to all the states and kind of you know, be the test ground for California. We've got some defunding Planned Parenthood efforts going on. So we have a, we have a lot to do. Um, and it's exciting because there's so much for, Mm -hmm. I think the pro-life generation to do, because I think often, and I'm sure you've heard this before, even from your sons, or you've probably heard it from millennials in the campaign trail of just feeling like I vote, but nothing ever changes. Right. But you really can make a difference. You can make a total difference, both in terms of of lobbying and speaking out and reaching out to, to state lawmakers. And at the same time as you're going to see in Virginia this year, uh, reaching out, it, this is where, right, you, you, that report you talked about, why there's mm-hmm. such a threat, mm-hmm. because grassroots, true grassroots activism has a much greater impact than the kind of big money we've seen on a Planned That's Parenthood right. in, in the congressional and Senate races. You make a tremendous difference in a legislative race. And so... Just helping a handful of more students go out yeah. and knock on doors, which is a lot of fun. That's actually yeah. where I started getting involved was with Students of Life knocking on doors myself in college. It's a lot of fun, but it can make a tremendous impact, particularly on the legislative right. level. And you don't actually need that much money to do it. No. You just need a lot of willing, able bodies. Yep. I think the biggest expense for us is going to be renting the charter buses to bus students in from Michigan and Ohio, students who don't who need a ride to be yeah. and then get hotel rooms for everybody. So sure. if you know a funder, make sure you send your checks to Students for Life Action. <laughs> but if you're a young person, make sure, you know, sign up and go to Students for Life Action uh, website, yeah. studentsforlifeaction.org. Sign up to be a part of your state squad because we're going to need you. We're going to need all hands on deck in, in Virginia. And I think this is a great kind of test case battleground for the pro-life generation to show uh, that we care uh, and that we're going to put our essentially money where our mouth is, that we're going to get out there and pound the payment. And honestly, you're right. Like knocking on doors can be a lot of fun. If you're kind of like us, sometimes it can be scary for people. Yeah. But once you get you know, the first couple few, if you go with and a friend. And people help out. Exactly. A lot of times, if you haven't done it before, somebody else goes out with you, you find out it's a lot of fun. If you got a Fitbit, hey, bring it along. Oh, there it's you easy, go. good way to get steps in. But between Virginia, uh, you know, the Commonwealth there in terms of legislative races and the Commonwealth of Kentucky, where we've got a really yeah. important race for governor. Those race. two races, yeah. Students for Life and the students involved with uh, on our campuses helping in each mm-hmm. of those uh, respective races will make a big, big difference. I mean, you talk about Kentucky. We're going to be busing students in there. I mean, you've got, you know, one of the most pro-life governors right now serving Absolutely. who has been under attack from day one Absolutely. and has done everything possible to try to shut down that last remaining abortion facility there yeah. in Louisville. Uh, so it's really important that we get out there support Governor Matt Levin. Matt Bevin is great. He yeah. is. He's fantastic. So make sure you sign up with Students for Life Action. Um, and, you know, I'm going to be interested to see how things go at YAF and partnering with you in the future because I, this is something that, you know, I was speaking to a YAF audience a couple weeks ago and 
I was I was amazed. I think there has been a shift mm -hmm. uh, in the young conservative movement. I remember when I first started Students for Life, we went to a CPAC, we went to you know other conservative events. You know, we were kind of like the redhead stepchild. Mm -hmm. You know, like oh, here comes the pro-lifers, here comes the social conservatives, the SoCo's. Right. Um, but that's now the majority. Um, it's a mainstream yeah. position within the Republican Party, within the conservative movement. As and it is amongst young people in general. Yeah. I mean, I think it's one of those That's people right. misunderstand, certainly the media does, that, uh, again, it's a human rights issue. It's a way to make a difference. It's a way to have an impact. Uh, and it can be aligned with all these other things. And I felt for years that that more and more young people are more libertarian than they are liberal, mm -hmm. Um but it's just a matter of conveying that. So all this, but, but people want to make a difference. They don't want the government necessarily dictating their lives, which is why I say a little bit more libertarian. We just got to make the case when it comes to the pro-life movement that you can be libertarian and still be pro-life or right. have a libertarian trend yes. uh, because you're saying, hey, government, stay out of the rest of my life. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. want you to over-regulate me or do all these other things. Or make me have really crappy health care. Yeah, but... I. I I think a fundamental responsibility of government at any level is, is to protect right. the life and liberty of our citizens. And what's more important than that when it comes to pro-life movement? That's right. Amen. I have nothing more to say. All right. Thanks for tuning in this week to Explicitly Pro-Life. Make sure you subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, anywhere uh, podcasts yeah. are available. Thanks, guys.